it's a great pleasure for me to be here, and uh, thank you all for being here. So I'm going to talk about uh, some work I've done on uh, speech production knowledge for uh, automatic for acoustic modeling. In uh, actually for DNA and acoustic modeling. Uh, first of all, there are different ways of representing speech production. We can use some uh, linguistic binary features, like these ones, the usual. And on the this side, we can actually measure articulatory data. I mean, we can measure how the vocal tract moves or behaves when it produces sound. And there's also some rep representations that are in between the two. Uh, one thing that I think it's worth to make clear is that any kind of uh, articulatory data we, we, we've been using is only available during training. And the acoustic model we've been considering is uh, are the DNA, the, these hybrid the DNA and HMM acoustic models where we use uh, deep neural networks to compute the phone posteriors. I, actually, here we have a different acoustic observation, not just one, and we make prediction about the phonetic phone state. Uh, so, first of all, I'm going to give you some motivations why we are using speech production knowledge for acoustic modeling. Then the second part is about uh, using measure articulatory uh, features for DNA and acoustic models. And the last part is, uh, using, is about using phonological uh, articulatory features in DNA and acoustic models. And this last part is uh, very clear. Yeah, will you also tell us a little bit about the articulatory features themselves before, because I don't know if it's time to assume that you know that they are. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, so how are they measured? What is measured? Yeah. So there are different ways to measure them. Probably the most popular one is the uh, most popular tool is the electromagnetic articulograph. So you place some, uh, some coils in the mouth of the person, and you apply an electromagnetic field. And these coils perturb this electromagnetic. That gives you uh, a quite precise measure of the position of the articulated features in the x, y, z uh, space. But we are going to use just the x, y. Why do you call this articulated features? These are actual locations of the articulated. Right? Yes, location. Then we get velocity <coughs> and acceleration. Yeah, we we call them. I mean, usually so the literature. Yes, yeah, yes. They are what is the spatial resolution? Are they within like one millimeter? What's the resolution? Yeah, within, definitely within. I, I can't tell you precisely. It's definitely within uh, the millimeter. I think. And what about the temporal resolution? How fast can you uh, Between uh, 200 hertz and 400 hertz. Okay, so very fast. Yeah, very fast. And you can see. This as a you know motion capture technique. Right. Uh, the only the thing is that you can measure things that are hidden, okay? like the tone. By yeah. usual motion capture, you have, you have sensor placed on the on the body, and uh, they can measure because they can be seen by the camera. And why in this case uh, you you can't see the the, the mouth with the, with the normal camera. So yeah, the reason I ask about temporal is I'm thinking, for example, I know like a retroflex R, ah, like R. Yeah. Is it the temporal high enough that you can see that the tongue is going that way? I mean, with 400 hertz, probably. I think so. Because it sounds more like 20 hertz. And there are also other techniques. For example, Raman has been using uh, this uh, Wisconsin uh, data set where they use X-rays. I don't think they, they can. They can use the X rays anymore to do this kind of thing. Oh, that was back in the 90s. So yeah, X -ray. Thanks. And uh, other, other techniques are, for example, ultrasounds, but they are not very accurate. How do you get phonology? Uh, from the labels. I show you, I mean, for example, you suppose you, you have a label like uh, uh, of the sound, like P. And then you can decompose it in a binary vector where you say, OK, it's a consonant 1. It's a vowel 0. It's a plausible 1, and so on. Yeah, I've been using the term articulatory features just because it's 
it's a bit easier, but you're right. In this case, are measured, then we see that they have these nice features. Uh, so part one, motivation. Uh, one of the motivations is that many phenomena of serving speech do not have a compact description in the, in the acoustic space. Okay, think about co-articulation. And the effect of the phonetic context is so large that it's more effective to use uh, context-dependent labels. So for example, for if we have the us sound, I'm, I'm, here I'm talking about phone labels and, on, and not phone state labels. It's more convenient, it's more effective to use uh, labels that also include uh, the context, okay? And one can say, okay, but all these transformations due to the phonetic context, they probably lie in a low, low dimensional manifold, and that manifold is the speech production manifold. So let's consider this example, okay? Uh, as each, each, each phoneme is, is uh, made up of different features, like voicing, nasalization, stuff like that. When we switch from one phoneme to another, some of them do not switch simultaneously. Okay, there is some overlap. So, for, for example, consider here, nasalization occurs before switching from A to N. And when we have this kind of overlap, we have uh, the articulation effect, okay, the phoneme context. If all the features switch at the same time, we wouldn't have any articulation. That's the point. So you can say, okay, there are just these few variables that produce the phonetic context. Okay, so the manifold is very low, low dimensional. And uh, if we think about the standard acoustic model, we can say that, okay, we already use some speech production knowledge for, uh, for acoustic modeling. So <coughs> if we have uh, context-dependent labels, we, we may end up, as you know, we end up with uh, hundreds, thousands of uh, possible labels. But using the, the classic pre-clustering uh, approach, we cluster them, them into clusters of, of similar uh, trifles or other kind of, uh, um, yeah. And to do that, we, we use some, uh, some uh, speech production knowledge. And the speech production knowledge is in the question question asked by the pre. Right? So this is an, an implicit no, uh, use of speech production. But we could say, OK, we could use more explicitly SPK for, in order to have uh, more parsimonious and uh, factorized acoustic models. I mean, uh, I was mentioning to speech production domain as a, as a low dimensional manifold where we have all these transformations. Explain in a compact way, we could think about adding a new layer here uh, that represents that manifold. So a latent uh, set of variables that represent that manifold. Usually in speech recognition, we have this phonological level and this acoustic level, or phonetic level, <coughs> maybe phonetic level as well. So that was an idea. Uh, this is an example of using speech production knowledge proposed by, by Carly in the school and uh, using dynamic Bayesian. It didn't work uh, very well though, because of, especially because of the technical problems with the uh, dynamical Bayesian networks. Uh, another way of uh, looking at the problem is, okay, we have all these context-dependent features, uh, context-dependent labels, we could say, uh, Okay, we have them because our acoustic features are not very invariant to, to the phonetic context. That's another thing to, to look at. And uh, the articulatory features seems to be uh, seems to be actually invariant. I mean, if we have to say per the, the articulatory target is always the same independently of, of the of the context. So that's, that's not a model. <laughs> so if, you, if we manage to, to map the acoustic features to articulatory features that are more invariant to context, we, we might have uh, better, uh, better input features. That was, uh, that's not a possible And uh, 
And I'm going to show you a slide where I took some, uh, I mean, this slide is not a superstar motivation. It's just something that seems reasonable and seem, seem to justify the, the use of articulatory feature. Uh, so here is, a, I took seven powers from a small data set from one speaker. Uh, all, the, these, all the powers were represented by a vector of 60 mass scale f max. And uh, I reduced the dimensionality with a default encoder with just two encoding nodes. And I did the same. In this case, though, the, uh, the, in, the initial uh, feature vector consisted of the, the same 60 mass scale f max plus 36 uh, measurements, okay? And same autoencoder, and you can see that here <coughs> vowels are clustered much better. This is measured articulatory data, so it's available to do the testing, and if you want, and uh, in some sense. And uh, still, it's important to see that we have such a behavior. If we had something worse than this, that would tell us, okay, probably it's not worth using. Um, well, just to be clear, in the first one, the autoencoder is trying to encode a, 50, a 60 dimensional uh, CC vector as 50 dimensional with a hidden layer of size 2. And that's what you're plotting. In the second one, are you, use, are you still predicting 60 dimensional outputs or are you predicting more than 60? Uh, so no, no. Yes, I'm still predicting. No, sorry, 60 plus the, the articulated feature. So, so you're also predicting the articulated yeah. feature? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, one, 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 one super uh, right criticism is that, OK, here we are using the real articulated features. But even when I use, I see what I mean. When I use uh, articulated features that are reconstructed from audio, I still I get something like this. And there's one last motivation that actually was the most important from my group. In my group, there are a different neuroscientist. Um, one of them is the guy who discovered the, the mirror neuron system. So these neurons that activate both when we observe an action and when we do the same action. And these neurons are in the, the motor core. So there, there can be some neuroscientists that can tell you, okay, motor ne uh, mirror neurons that do not exist, but still, uh, this was a uh, a big discovery in the late in the in the 90s, in neuroscience. And uh, what is uh, there is a growing evidence in neurophysiological studies showing that the motor cortex, so suppose the motor cortex that actually move the vocal tract articulators, actually affects speech perception. So if you want, if you are, uh, if we perturb the motor cortex for uh, tongue movement, that affects the perception of speech. And that is quite, quite impressive. And there are results on adults and, uh, and the infants as well. I mean, in infants, people do not actually perturb the motor part of, of the kids because it's not like the, that issues. But it's okay to do that with adults. With? It's okay to do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some. So, so this technique is called uh, Tanskanian magnetic stimulation. I mean, the technique to perturb is okay unless you have you. You don't have some uh, health issues uh, like epilepsy. <coughs> Otherwise, it's safe. That's what they told. Uh, so, second part is using articulatory measurement. Okay, the kind of uh, as input features. Okay, the kind of measurement are these ones. Okay, is the upper lip, lower lip, upper incisor. Uh, actually, we don't use upper incisor. Lower incisor, and then three points of tone deep body and dorsum, and we use uh, position, velocities, and acceleration. And this is the, the very simple approach, OK? Without this part, this is the usual uh, HMM, DNN HMM uh, uh, model, acoustic model. What we do, we apply this part. We do acoustic to articulatory mapping. That is acoustic inversion. 
Why we do that? Because during training, we both have acoustics and uh, motor data. During testing, we don't have articulatory data. Right? We, we just have the audio. So what we, we can do, we, we try to reconstruct the movement. And we, to do that, we learn this acoustic to articulatory mapping mm -hmm. during training. This is also called acoustic inversion. This, the hope is that by doing so, mm -hmm. we get some more additional, I mean, we, no, we don't get any additional information. We actually transform the acoustic domain in a new domain that gives us more, that is more discriminatory, okay? No, here there's no information, no new information, okay? We just transform the, the, the acoustic domain. Of course, there, there are risks here, okay? One is, okay, but doing this kind of task, uh, carrying out this kind of task may be more difficult than actually predicting posteriors from uh, from posteriors from the uh, I'm zooming in the DNN, this DNN here, and what you can see is, okay, it's like a multitask problem in the sense that the prediction of all these. Uh, uh, Articulator points, or flash, they are called flash points, and they are velocities and accelerations. They all share the same network, okay? But the prediction of this is independent of this one, okay? So they are independent of each other, which is not the, is not the best way. We, I mean, they are extremely correlated to each other. So this task can be very tough. I mean, what is actually correlated to speech? is the configuration of the vocal tract, or the coordinating movements of the vocal tract articulator, not just the, you know, the, um, the single point of the vocal tract independently of the other. So if we had the transformation of this, where with new features that actually uh, encode uh, coordinating movements, we may facilitate the, the acoustic articulatory method. So I'm going to tell you just a couple of properties of the acoustic articulatory mapping. It's nonlinear, which is OK with the, with the DNS. Can be non-unique in the sense that the speech sound can be produced by uh, different position of the vocal tract. Uh, so DNS may be not optimal because uh, uh, the conditional uh, distribution here. I mean, the, uh, which gives the, I mean, the conditional distribution of uh, acoustic feature, articulatory features given the acoustic evidence can be like this. And in this case, DNN are not the best solution. But this, this property is actually quite limited. Uh, I mean, it's limited. Uh, another th important thing is that depending on the phone you, you have to produce, uh, some articulators are critical that is important, some others are not and can be worth taking into account that. And we addressed explicitly that in the in previous work. Um, now, what, what I was saying before was about transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it can be worth transforming the articulatory domain in a new domain for the reason I was saying before to implicitly address non-uniqueness and this uh, phone dependency, the fact that some articulators are only critical for some phone sounds and uh, not for others. And also, we can also think about, OK, let's remove, I mean, there are measurement errors in the, in the articulatory data. M maybe we can remove them, okay. not just by doing smoothing, but also uh, by doing this transformation. Uh, so what we did is, Rather than uh, performing the acoustic to articulatory mapping from the acoustic features to the raw articulatory features, we, we try to do acoustic to articulatory mapping on the transformed articulatory features. Okay. So I make this uh, short. So we use, so autoencoders, I, I guess most of you know what they are. We have an input and you want to reconstruct the, the input uh, going through this, uh, this structure. Okay? So this is the encoding part of input. You, got to, you encode the input, and then you like that the encoding allows you to have a good reconstruction. Of the input. And you want to minimize some uh, uh, 
um, distance function between the input and the output usually is a uh, mean square error. Okay. Uh, another thing is using the noisy autoencoders, which simply what they do, they take the same input, they corrupt it by adding some, uh, for example, some Gaussian noise on each feature, and they still try to reconstruct the error between this one and this one. The idea is that you get some uh, some some representation here where you actually capture the very important patterns that allows you to do to do a good reconstruction. If the noise is similar to the noise you have in the measurement, like Gaussian noise, you can also gain for free some uh, robustness to the error measurement. Uh, another thing I, I, I tried was this very simple thing. Uh, okay, I said, but let, let's exploit also the label input the supervised information. So we have an example of a frame of a phone here. We could say, okay, let's pick up as a substitute, let's pick up another frame of the same phone state, another example of the same phone state. So yes, that's not actually perturbation. We just pick up a frame which should be, which has the same phone state of the, this frame, but it's different, okay? And we, we did that. We could say, okay, by doing that, also with the noise that we actually are not imposing constraints on the encoding. And what we did with this kind of encoder was to impose constraints. Like, we want that different frames of uh, referring to the same phone state looks as much possible as similar to each other in the encoding state. So we want the same encoding states for different examples of the same uh, of the same phone state. So here are the results. Uh, First of all, I have to apologize because the data sets I used are, are small, okay? And uh, because the articulatory data, the articulatory data set are very small. And so, if you don't like small, I don't like small data set as well, but if you don't like small data set, you, you be disappointed. I mean, I guess you can be very disappointed with the, this kind of uh, analysis, but it's all, uh, all, all that I, it's what I have, okay? Uh, so this is the baseline. I, I, I work on two data sets. This one is, uh, I, I guess, 40 minutes of speech from one speaker. This one is probably more than an hour of speech from one speaker. Uh, baseline is this one. This is the phone array using uh, DNA HMM. OK, this one is without pre-training. This one is what I got by using uh, bottleneck features, so still acoustic features, no articulatory. Here is what I get when I use real uh, articulatory features. This is a not, it's not a real scenario in the sense that during testing, as I said, I don't have uh, this kind of uh, information. In all the cases below, I reconstruct the, the articulatory features. Here I reconstruct the raw articulatory features. And here I reconstruct the, the transform articulatory features with the, the different autoencoders. The autoencoders that perform best are the, the noisy autoencoder and, and this autoencoder, the one where I pick up a different example of the same phone state. And uh, I, since these are very small data set, I had to, to run some statistical um, significant tests. And yeah, the results are significant. Uh, either when I use uh, raw articulated features and when I use the uh, transform ones. And that the same thing applies to the MNGU data sets where I have a stronger baseline. Ah, I forgot saying this is the frame level for the classification error. And this is what I have. So they work for this very, and I also try to do, to try to understand how they do they generalize in noisy conditions, okay? So the training is still on clean speech. Testing is uh, on noisy speech, different signal to noise ratio, different kind of noise. What you see here is not the phone error rate, it's the phone error rate reduction with respect to the acoustic baseline. So here the phone error reduction is, for example, for the system using uh, autoencoded transform features is 8%, here is 
6% with the system using raw particulate vintage. And you can see it's often below, uh, above zero, uh, up to a certain point. When, when the speech becomes become too noisy, uh, it articulated features do not work uh, anymore very well, which is something that uh, is opposite to some previous findings. I mean, people show that if you use articulated features, maybe you don't get any improvement in the clean speech, but you get some improvement in noise speech. It's exactly the, the opposite. Um, so there are several limitations with this approach. I mean, this approach is, I think, is, is interesting from a scientific point of view, but on the application side, there are different, uh, several limitations. Uh, of course, as I said, the results you have seen so far are speaker dependent. Uh, we need to move to the, for example, to the Wisconsin data set that has many more speakers and see if we can uh, work on uh, what we do on speaker independent. Uh, case. I, I'm, I'm optimistic about that, but still, uh, we have to see that. And there are obviously technological limitations. As I said before, uh, articulatory data are very difficult to measure. And uh, the other part is that what we measure is a very, even if, I mean, yeah, what we measure is just part of the story. I mean, we measure uh, vocal track. Uh, movements of the vocal tract, but we don't have any information about the airflow, for example. Okay. I mean, we miss a lot of information. Maybe there's some implicit information about the airflow in the in the vocal tract movements, but you also don't try to estimate volumes from uh, from positions, do you? Uh, you mean like uh, vocal tract constrictions and placement? Right, uh, we, because we, if we, you we, estimated the volume of the of the um, uh, in vowels, if you tried to estimate the volumes of the cavities, you you might in some cases get a better estimate of what is essentially the formic characteristics than by inferring it from the positions. Am I right? You're right. <clears throat> and then that touches on another issue, which is that there are really two kinds of co-articulation. One you described as simultaneous uh, positioning or movement of articulators, and the other is simply change a, a different target because of the uh, of the position. In other words, you already take into account the fact that you're going to have to realize a different target, and you aim for a different target. So that the path is not the differentiator; it's the actual target, which is very typical with vowels. So if you, in other words, you're going to have a different set of formants even at the even at the target position than you would have if you had a different neighbor. Yeah. So it's not the path by because of different articulators moving, it's the actual it's an actual recomputation of the target. And you're trying to do both of those at once. Yeah. Right? So that's just a suggestion why yeah, yeah, sure. the effect with respect to vocalic articulations and the effect with respect to uh, consonantal articulations might be separable. I see. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if it's fully related with what you said, but one thing is that our idea of transforming the features was going in the direction of, uh, uh, let's see if we automatically derive something that tells us about the, the, the constriction, because that's more relevant, more, more uh, linked to the actually articulatory targets. Of course, it's also about, this is kind of old-fashioned thinking to think about the, the formats and the and the, and the cavities as being the, the targets. And you may have already lost some of that by using MFCCs. That, that, that may have already purged some of that information. By the way, we also try, we also uh, transform the articulatory features into the articulatory phonology features. So that gives you the, you know, the, the vocal tract constrictions in different locations. And this seems to this seems to help a little bit. Uh, and, that, that, and as long as they're language dependent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, things yeah. like art, like nasalization differ very much from language to language, and so you. Yeah. yeah. So you can see, okay, why you work on these uh, these small data sets? I mean, 
it's not super exciting. Uh, the first, I did that because, uh, so in the past, people tried to, to work on these data sets, no improvement at all. Okay. So I said, okay, if we want to show some utility for the articulated features, let's start from the, the speaker dependent case and see what happens. And uh, so, as you've seen, there are results in speaker dependent case. Uh, there are results in speaking independent case on TAN and GMM and HMM. Uh, recent result from, uh, from Raman and Karen and uh, Iran, uh, where they show the utility of uh, using articulatory data in, uh, in the width concept. Uh, one thing I, we must do in the future is to better understand how the articulated features affect the font, uh, the font classifier DNA, the classifier computing compost series, that, that must be done. I mean, that will help us a lot to understand what's going on in the DNA. And the other thing, I mean, it's a very super reasonable uh, criticism about the use in general of art measure articulated features is the following. You can say, okay, we have deep neural networks. Uh, and you are getting some uh, utility from, from articulatory data. But you could get the same uh, utility, the same, uh, the same kind of help, if you had a huge amount of acoustic data, okay? So the, 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 the most, most uh, important challenge is to see that even when you have uh, a lot of uh, acoustic data, a lot, uh, you still get some benefit from using a small amount of articulatory data. I think that's the, if we don't do that, probably we, we are still, uh, yeah, we, we need to do that. So. But I, I, I just believe that we, we need to do this kind of stuff before that. Uh, alternative approaches are the, the multi-view approach proposed by, by Raman, which I think is a smarter idea of exploiting articulatory data. So as I told you before, I transform the articulatory domain uh, and perform acoustic articulatory mapping on it. What uh, Raman proposed was uh, let's transform both domains to find two new projections that maximize the correlation between the two. Okay? So the transformation of the articulatory domain is kind of aware of the transformation of the acoustic domain. And they both try to transform in order to find a uh, mass correlation, okay, broadly speaking. And once you've done that, you take the transform of all your features and you append them to the usual acoustic uh, uh, Another thing I try, this is super preliminary, but you can also think about uh, some kind of transfer learning uh, approach where uh, that, that actually is, can be helpful in the cross-speaker setting I, may, I was mentioning, which is setting where you have a small amount of articulatory data from one data set and a lot of acoustic data from another one. And you can say, okay, I could use the acoustic articulatory mapping DNA to initialize the DNA that computes the compass series. So it's like, uh, it's a sort of, maybe it's more like a curriculum learning approach. You, First, you're trying to learn the, the speech production, uh, the level of speech production level, and then the one at the chronological level. Okay, this last part is very preliminary. Uh, and this, uh, I just wanted to see, okay, can I do something by using linguistic features rather than articulatory data? I mean, as I, there are a lot of limitations by using articulatory data. So I, I wanted to see if there, I could do something with uh, uh, linguistic articulated features, uh, phonological articulated features, um, and I use these kind of features, okay? the, the usual ones. And they are binary features. So what I did was what I call phonological embedded, probably phonetic embedded can be a better word for that. And the idea was, uh, one of the motivations was, can I build a continuous representation of my speech production domain uh, by using discrete uh, features? And this is the, the following idea. Uh, 
So we have the font state level. Suppose that we observe more than one frame. This is the center frame. We observe more than one frame. For each frame, we have a font state level. We transform it in a binary vector, where one one feature is zero if uh, if the the articulated feature is absent and is one when there is the articulated feature. So, for example, for the for the yeah. So for the uh, if this is a the sound, uh, we have one for the plausive features. We have one for the uh, alveolar features. And what we do, we try to <coughs> we do this transformation when we apply a deep neural network. We use a deep neural network to predict the the mal f band features. So to predict the acoustic observation. And we get this hidden layer, and we call it a uh, Phonological vector. This is a representation of uh, new representation of the of the phone as it, and of its context. And I use rectified uh, linear units for this, especially because of the sparse because of the sparse. Uh, so as I said, what they represent is uh, the phonetic context and the current form in terms of uh, articulated features. Uh, here the interesting part is by doing this, I have a representation of the phonetic context where I only take into account features, articulated features that, that matter, that are important to, um, let's say, to, um, uh, to partition the acoustic domain. And I don't know, is, is that clear? Or, uh, probably we mentioning the related work, it would be more clear. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you one possible way to, to use this phonological value. So this is my usual network. And I can do, uh, I can apply a multi, I can use a multitask framework. So this is the network computing the phone state posteriors. And my first task is the computing a phone posteriors. The second task is to have uh, here a either representation that matches the phonological values. So this is the secondary task. And I use a, a lambda to weight the secondary task. So this kind of features is uh, some way similar to what the clustering tree does. Okay? You have uh, as input the these articulatory features and these articulatory questions, if you want, and you try to partition the, the acoustic domain. Uh, actually, the DNN makes prediction, but you can see that as a sort of <coughs> partition of the acoustic domain. This is exactly the same DNS that uh, has been used for deep neural network based statistical parametric speech synthesis, which works pretty well. Uh, so, related work is. Uh, Maybe this related work can help you better understand. So uh, there have been in the past some work that people said, OK, uh, before computing the four posteriors, first try to predict the linguistic articulated features. Then from those predictions, you predict uh, the four posteriors. Something which is very related to that is, uh, again, a multitask approach. You predict the phone labels. And sec as a second task, you predict the articulatory features of that frame. Okay. Uh, this is a bit prescriptive because, uh, as we have seen at the beginning of the talk, we know that because of co-articulation, I mean, in one frame, we can have uh, overlapping uh, articulatory features due to the uh, to the close to the feature to the phone states that are close to the, to the center. Another related task is very recent, is uh, this one. So as a primary task, I still predict the font state label. This was done by uh, people at Google. As a secondary or a third task, I predict the context. Okay? So um, I want to predict the, the, the font label of this frame, but I also want to predict, for example, the frame label of the previous frame and the frame label of the following frame. This is a 
a very implicit way of uh, uh, taking into account the context, right? of modeling the context. Uh, more recently, uh, Bell and Rinas proposed this idea of, I mean, what they did was a, a different representation of the context, which is given by uh, Tapros, for example, consider this one, where the context is given by each each pair of the of the label of the current frame and all of possible uh, acoustic features of the previous frame. Uh, by doing that, you end up having a lot of targets here and a lot of targets here. Here, the the possible criticisms to this approach is that consider this case where you have uh, the font state label of the, pre the next one and of the previous one. Uh, you try to predict them independently of how they are important, how they affect that font. So you may have some following fonts that actually do not affect the, the current font that much, while others that are, that are very important. So you, you consider them all important at the same time. Why in our case with these phonological embeddings, we actually weigh the importance of the context. So these are the results I got on the MNGU zero data set. This is the baseline, which is a bit better because I use rectified linear units. This is what I got by using uh, new results, by using uh, reconstructed measure at inflatory data. And this is what I want to use uh, phonological embeddings. The lambda here is uh, the weight given to the secondary task. And I run that different times, the same thing. Uh, I did the same on Timmy. I excluded the, sil the silences because I think I have a problem with silences so far. And the baseline is, as you, as you know, is not the best one. I mean, the previous, uh, the first work on DNN acoustic modeling on TIMIT with no silences, they reported a 23% of accuracy rate. They used actually larger context, uh, but I, I didn't, I didn't spend too much time on the baseline because uh, I wanted to see if this approach somehow will work. But I definitely need to get a better baseline. Uh, this is what I get. These are results on the test. Uh, core set, and these are on the validation set. As you can see, again, there's some. Uh, the net I use to compute the phonological embeddings is a net that considers nine frames of context uh, as these two in the layer. I took the phonological embeddings from this layer, and what I, I observed is that actually most of them are always zero. So I remove them, and this number tells you out of these 600 nodes, actually only 230 are, are active once in a while. Okay? All the other ones are always zero. So it's like, I mean, the, the net is learning uh, a low dimensional manifold. I mean, I can speculate. Um, I did that several times. As you can see here, the, the value of the baseline varies, varies because uh, I change the initial initialization every time. Another, uh, I change the initialization, then I cap the initialization for all the other uh, iteration. Uh, no iteration. Other um, okay, uh, frame stuff. I mean, what I need is one, uh, and always get more or less good results. Uh, I also, I mean. Here I'm just to facilitate visualization. I only show four of them, but uh, it's what I get in general. With different configurations, with different observation windows. What I found out, though, is that if the 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 um, re rectified linear units, the phonological embedding is not sparse enough have something like this. If it's too sparse, I don't have uh, good results. So as I said, this is very preliminary because uh, I still don't get what is going on while in phonological embeddings. 
I still have to compare with previous work to see if I actually am I getting some information. I am destroying some of the offered information, and actually, I could do better if I wouldn't destroy it. And uh, and feedback for this kind of approach are very 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 welcome. Okay. And I apologize for for, for the fact that this this is very preliminary. But. Uh, it's another way, I want to, to present this because it's another way of exploiting articulated features, okay? the linguistic ones. Uh, the articulate measure one has a lot, as you see, have a lot of uh, limitations, so that can be another way to, okay, to use articulated information in a more explicit way and see if we can get that. Okay, I uh, just want to acknowledge the contribution of Claudia Canelari, who was a, previous, uh, a former PhD student who worked on the part related to major articulatory features, and all these guys who are actually not people working on speech recognition, but uh, shared with me some ideas and actually made this work uh, possible, and to European <coughs> And thank you. Was that you know, particularly when you were starting to do the acoustic to articulatory inversion, but also with some of the later uh, models that you presented, you were trying to predict the articulatory measurements, which are both position and velocity. But you were, and you were, of course, using multiple acoustic frames 3, 5, 9, and 12. But at the same time, you're still doing a frame-by-frame frame prediction of the articulatory measurements. Yeah. And the, like, you know, the articulatory measurements, more than even the acoustics, are amenable to being thought of as a, uh, as, like, you know, observations of a dynamical system, because there are real articulatory dynamics going on. Yeah. So why don't you consider modeling them with something like a recurrent net, even if you're going to do recurrent net? Absolutely. Uh, that was something I was discussing this morning with uh, okay. with uh, with the Raman. And the thing I was saying, we were discussing, is that suppose you have a um, recurrent neural network, and probably rather than using articulated features as input to this uh, neural network, so you, suppose you have a recurrent neural network to predict form posteriors. Okay. To predict form posteriors, okay. form state posteriors. One thing is, rather than using uh, articulatory features uh, as input features, uh, you could put them in the hidden state. So you can also, in the hidden layer, you can also model the dynamics of the articulatory, of the articulatory data. Or you can do what you said. I mean, you use articulatory features as uh, outputs, and you predict the dynamics. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's something we definitely need to do. No, because I'm thinking that one may even argue with thinking about the uh, phonological, uh, like you know, the HMM state, the cortex and HMM state targets. You may even want to argue whether or not uh, they come out of some kind of dynamical system, because maybe they change abruptly at some point. Yeah. But at least with the articulators, it's very clear that it's actually a physical system that's moving. So at least that part, I think, yeah, yeah, no, something that's you can do in the future. Actually. Absolutely. So you can you rephrase it? Uh, yeah. So you showed that the articulated features measured or dictated. Okay. Uh, both of them were not giving you any benefits in robustness. Yeah. No, no, they, they were. I mean, okay, uh, depends. In the They, they give you some benefits up to a certain as an average. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So here, yeah, just 
are you just using DLS? The, I think these observations might be because they are using the recreated articulation. Yes. They are using the actual articulated features. Yeah. So, if I use actual articulated features, I have something. Because they are not affected by the noise. So, or yeah, more like that. So, I am actually interested in uh, the motivation behind using articulated features in there. If the acoustic articulated mapping is not going to be as robust as the acoustics to the phone state mapping. Okay. Yeah. That's probably probably what happens there, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm have to, yeah, below the, in this case, below zero, that's what you're saying. I mean, the acoustic-articulated method is less robust. One, one thing I really like to try is, uh, uh, which is super simple and obvious, but nobody has done that, and probably it's what, what's going on in the, in, in the kids learning, uh, learning a language is to do multi-condition learning of the acoustic articulatory method. So, you know, you, you produce sound, but you can, this kind of sound can be affected by environmental noise all the time, but your articulatory data is always the same. Maybe it doesn't matter, okay? Maybe because then you have to compare with a baseline train on a multi-condition uh, something, but, yeah. So the other question I have is, when they are actually using uh, recreated uh, articulated features, uh, data size is no, no longer a limitation because you could generate these features for any acoustic data that's going on. So, did you have any observations on how exactly these features are available as you increase the amount of data that is available to train the picture? You mean? So, for example, learn the AAM map on what some speakers you have and then. Uh, do use the same inversion map uh, on Tibet. Yeah, 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 okay. Now, I mean, that's something we, we need to do. It's not, yeah, yeah, it's not, well, as you already did for on the Wisconsin, right? You train the, your CCA features, some speakers, but then test them on other ones. Yeah, 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 that's, that's but still the... still, that's a very small subset. Yeah, so the, the best way would be to do all the training on, on the Wisconsin data set and then testing on Tibet. We definitely need to do that. Or you could, like, you could do this in the setting when you're doing this multi-task style training. Mm -hmm. You could always do it where you use all the acoustics with no articulatory plus the acoustics and articulatory. Yeah. And for part of the training example, it's doing multi-task and for the rest, it's just doing regular. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, that's it. Any other questions? Last question. Um, yeah. So, this might be a question. So, have you thought, have you worked at all, um, say, a similar model, but instead of having the like, speech to the transcriptions, so you're only going from text, basically, you learn, you want to learn a mapping from text to articulated. <laughs> if you could do that, then, um, if, Basically, if that was uh, reliable, I don't know. Is that basically is, is there a good mapping from text to articulatory features? Do you think that's an easy, is that an easier problem than from speech to articulatory? That's what we did for the YouTube. <laughs> the idea is then if then you, if that's like or if that's like you could train on lots of uh, text. I, I was thinking about the child. You mean, you mean text or how children can percent. like create their own sounds and they know what their what they know what their articulation is and they know what sound they're trying to produce. So no, no, that that's a very good point. Also because I mean, if you try to do acoustic articulatory mapping, it's difficult because both the input and the output depends on the speaker. But in your case, you at least the input will be speaker independent, right? Yeah. yeah. So in theory, it should be easier. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much the. I, I guess. I mean, I don't, I don't know how much you can get from the transcription. But I think this is. I mean, this part here. 
you know, it's from the transcription, I try to predict the, the acoustic observation. And they do a pretty good job, actually. I mean, I look mainly at the, at the correlation, not at the mean square error. They, I mean, that's why also deep neural network-based uh, uh, speech synthesis uh, work. This, this so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, so let's thank our speaker once again.